Welcome to Physical Anthropology. In Chapter 8, we're going to be taking a look at primate evolution. The topics for today include looking at the various hypotheses about primate evolution and why it occurred, and then looking at the evolutionary history of primates, including the rise of mammals, the adipoids and amomyoids, the platyrrhini evolution, and the catarrhini evolution. So why did primates evolve? Where did they come from? What's going on with that? We actually have three different possible hypotheses, and all of them have different types of evidence supporting them. So the first hypothesis is the arboreal hypothesis. Arboreal has to do with forests and trees. So this hypothesis explains that the reason primates look the way they do is because they evolved to be adapted to a forest habitat. And there is evidence to support this. For example, the vast majority of primates that are alive today do live in the forests, specifically tropical forests, regardless of which continent they live on. Many of them still live in the trees, though some of them have evolved to now live on the ground instead. And many of them have these adaptations that are excellent for living in trees, such as the grasping fingers, the ability to see in 3D, so they can judge distances when they're jumping from tree branch to tree branch, and also the ability to um, to eat the objects in the trees, whether it's the fruit, the leaves, or the insects. The next hypothesis is a little bit more specific. It's the visual predation hypothesis. In this hypothesis, the reason we have these traits, such as the 3D vision and color vision, is because we evolved to hunt insects. So this is a, just an alternative way of explaining why those traits are in primates. Finally, the angiosperm primate coevolution hypothesis says that our early primate ancestors actually evolved to eat fruit. One kind of interesting idea for that one is that if you look at fruit, a lot of times the unripe fruit is still green or yellow, while the ripe fruit is a brighter color like red. So this could explain why color vision evolved, as well as some of those other traits which would be about living in the trees. Now this picture hopefully looks familiar to you. It is that history of life on earth, all the different eras. And what we're gonna look at is specifically uh, primate origins. So primate origins are going to happen after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So let's kind of review a little bit here. The Mesozoic uh, time period, the Mesozoic time period was also referred to as the age of the dinosaurs. And that's because for many hundreds of millions of years during that Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous period, the dinosaurs were the dominant organisms on land. However, mammals did exist at this time period. So mammals did evolve about 200 million years ago, but they were these small little, um, almost rat-like or shrew-like creatures that lived in the trees in the forests. And they were not that, not that widespread. So what happened at the end of the Cretaceous is that unfortunately there was this mass extinction for dinosaurs, but the mass extinction for the dinosaurs was an amazing opportunity for mammals. And what happened is that the mammals evolved very rapidly to take over all of the empty niches that the dinosaurs left behind. Now, do you remember the name of that kind of evolution? When you start with an organism, which is one type of organism, one type of body shape, and it evolves rapidly to all of these many different type of organisms. So some of them might now live in the trees still, others might now live on the ground, others might uh, move into the water, others might move into the air and be able to fly. So why is all of this rapid evolution occurring? There's a name for that, we call it adaptive radiation. So now that all these mammals exist, you see the first primates almost immediately after the extinction of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. So here's my first review question for you. The arboreal hypothesis of primate origins emphasizes that primates, A, have grasping hands and feet, B, have a fruit eating tendency, C, long legs compared to arms, or D, acute sense of smell. So remember that for arboreal, it had to do with being in the trees and to be able to grasp the branches of the trees, you need A. Next question for you. 
the visual predation hypothesis argues that the unique traits of primates evolved in order to hunt what? A, reptiles, B, birds, C, insects, or D, mice. In the case of this early primate, we think it evolved to potentially eat insects. Finally, the angiosperm primate co-evolution hypothesis notes that the earliest primates likely ate what? So angiosperm refers to a type of plant that has flowers. And the reason it has flowers is because it's used to attract pollinators to produce fruit. So what we think they ate was fruit. In this image, what I'm gonna show you is where modern primates can be found. So we have the New World monkeys, which we've discussed before. These guys are only found in the tropical areas of South and Central America. Next, we have the prosimians, which of course is not a correct grouping in terms of evolution, but the lemurs are only found here on Madagascar, the island of Madagascar, while things like lorises and tarsiers, um, well, lorises are found in both Central Africa as well as some islands over here in Asia. Tarsiers are only found here in the Philippines. Then we have the old world monkeys. Old world monkeys are going to be found in Africa as well as throughout the Middle East and Southern Asia. And then apes. So for apes, things like gibbons and orangutans are found over here in Southeast Asia, while chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas are only found in Central Africa. So that's where the primates are now, but where did they come from? Or how did they migrate? Where did they go? What's going on with that? It has to do with the fossil evidence that we can find. And one thing to kind of keep in mind is the image on the bottom right, the idea that we did used to have this uh, massive continent called Pangaea, and that Pangaea started to break up about 200 million years ago or so, and the continent started to drift apart. So once the continents drifted apart, there's going to be less interbreeding across groups. Right? And so there's going to be more evolution the more distantly these primates are separated from each other because they're going to continue to evolve in their own unique environment, but there's not going to be any gene flow amongst those populations. This next map is showing you that during the Eocene uh, epoch, we're going to have fossils of the adipoid and the amamyoid in these areas. We actually do see it in North America, in Africa, in what will eventually become Europe, as well as in Asia. So what is this Eocene time period? It's right here. It's right around between 34 million years ago all the way back to 55 million years ago. Now, how did the primates get from one continent to another? In some cases, the islands may have been close enough that they could actually, you know, walk across depending on um, the environment. It's also possible that they could cross uh, bodies of water if there were something else that was floating across. So in this uh, picture on the right, we're talking about how uh, this particular early primate, which kind of looks like a vertical clinger leaper, may have started off here in Asia and then migrated across to the European continent and then over to North America. Then in the bottom picture, we have what's happening in the Miocene. These are specifically apes. So now that's a subcategory of primates, right? And we know that modern day apes mostly live here in Africa. Some of them still live here in Asia, but the ones that used to live in, in Europe, all of these guys have gone extinct. The uh, Miocene time period would have been after the Eocene. So it would have been right here, about five to uh, 16 million years ago. So we did have some evidence of archaic primates that existed right after the, the uh, extinction of the dinosaur 65 million years ago. But what we're gonna focus on are the U primates or the true primates. So these are going to be the direct ancestors of some of our modern primate groups, including the adipoids, which are going to be the ancestors of lemurs and lorises, as well as the omomyoids, which are the ancestors of tarsiers. So let's compare this two groups to each other. The adipoids are these ancestral animals that were diurnal. You hopefully recall that that means they are active during the day. 
They were herbivorous, so they're eating plant material, and they were relatively large. Now, we know that some lemurs are still diurnal, but some of these other animals, like the lorises, have actually become nocturnal. Then for the amamyoid, we have nocturnal, insectivorous, frugivorous, and relatively small. But interestingly, the tarsiers are no longer uh, frugivorous. They're eating small animals now. You've seen this image before. This is the cladogram that shows the evolutionary relationships of all of our modern living primates. So what we can do for this tree right now is add the adipoids and the amomyoids here because the adipoids would have basically been the beginning of the group of strepsirhini. While the amomyoids, it's not quite clear where exactly they belong. We know that they're the ancestors of the tarsiers, but how are they related to these other two groups, the platyrhini and the catarhini? That is still up to debate. And I'm gonna show you a couple different hypotheses on how they might be related. So this is a more detailed uh, cladogram that now shows not just the living organisms. So these are all of our living primates here at the tips of the branches, but it also shows some examples of animals that have gone extinct. So like these guys here, they've gone extinct. The adipoids are of course the ancestors. There's many branches here that have gone extinct. Here's the amomyoids. And what we see is that right here is kind of a big question mark. So we're not sure whether a branch split off long before the amomyoids came into existence and that that branch then became the ancestors of apes and monkeys, or did it happen after the amomyoids um, evolved? And on the right hand, I have a couple different possible hypotheses of what could happen. So in this example, the anthropoids and the adipoids actually have the most common recent ancestor. So that's in complete opposite to what we see on the picture on the left. In the second cladogram, the anthropoids are related to the tarsiers, but their common ancestor is longer ago than the amomyoids. So that's most similar to what we have in this picture on the left. And then the bottom one says that the anthropoids and the tarsiers are actually like a cousin species. They have a common ancestor, but the amomyoids and uh, existed even before that. So it's just an alternative way. It's really hard to sometimes figure out these evolutionary relationships because we have missing links in the fossil record. And what you're gonna see is that while fossils do exist, sometimes there can be hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years in gaps between the samples that we find. So if we found um, an animal that exists here, and then we find an animal that exists here, we have to hypothesize on what happened in between. We're not quite sure until we find another fossil that fits in there. And then that's usually a missing link. And we'll talk about missing links more when we get to human evolution, uh, because for a long time there were missing links and new fossil evidence helped shape our hypotheses of how human evolution has occurred. So don't forget science is an evolving process. And as new evidence comes into being, we use that to change our hypotheses and update them. So the next uh, picture is going to look at the platyrhines. So what happened with them? Like, where did they come from? Because we know that there's no direct ancestors of them existing in South America. So the question is, how did they get to South America? And there's four different possible hypotheses in this image. So in image number one, what we think is that the existing monkeys that did live in North America or the ancestors of these monkeys that they just migrated down to South America using Central America as their path. And then the South American monkeys continued to exist while the North American monkeys went extinct. So that's one possibility. A second possibility is that they came from Africa directly to South America. So they had to cross the water, cross the ocean to get there. The third hypothesis is that they did get to South America, but not across the Atlantic, instead through um, a smaller gap to Antarctica and then to South America. Now, you might wonder like, why on earth would they go to Antarctica? Remember that when this is happening with continental drift, Antarctica wasn't necessarily as freezing cold as it is now. So because the continent would have been, uh, you know, at a different latitude, it might've still been pleasant enough for this migration to be possible. 
And then the fourth hypothesis here is that they simply originated independently. Um, there's just not as much evidence of that. So the most plausible scenario we think is going to be um, this scenario right here uh, in number two, which is that they did originate in Africa. And then what happened is they crossed over to South America, possibly when those two continents were still close enough for this to, to be able to happen. They didn't swim or anything like that. Instead, they may have uh, gotten trapped onto these vegetation rafts, um, which are, you know, like large debris of fallen trees and other things like that. And they would just kind of float along with the wind until they reached South America. Now, of course, some animals would get lost at sea, but as long as a few of them made it to South America, then they could now take over any part of the ecosystem there that has an empty niche. And so the, the monkeys in South America are actually quite successful, and they would have continued to evolve separately from their relatives in Africa. We know, of course, that the South American uh, monkeys do have some unique traits that are only found there, like that prehensile tail. So now let's look at the Catarini and what's going on with them. So one of the earliest fossils that we find is something called the Egyptopithecus. And this organism was relatively large for, for a monkey. And it was an arboreal quadruped, meaning it is running around in the trees using all four limbs. There's clear sexual dimorphism because in the fossil, um, in this image, the right organism is the male and the left organism is the female, the same species. So the male is clearly larger. It has larger canines, a much more robust skull. Now this ancestor went extinct, but we think that there's another common ancestor between the monkeys and the apes about 25 million years ago. So down here, these are gonna be all of our old world monkeys, while up here we have all of these apes and they diverged about 25 million years ago. Following this graph, let's continue. About 18 years ago would have been the last common ancestor between the lesser apes. So the lesser apes are the gibbons and the siamongs versus the great apes, which include the chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. About 14 million years ago would have been the evolution of the orangutans in their own branch. Then about 12 million years ago was our common ancestor with gorillas. And finally, about 9 million years ago would have been the last common ancestor between the chimpanzees and the humans. We do know that the chimpanzees and the humans are, of course, the most related of the existing living primates. And we share about 98% of our DNA. So it took 9 million years just for those 2% differences to evolve. And then this branch right here, the human branch, is going to be where we're going to continue the conversation in the future on human evolution. So that's now going to be all the hominins, all of those uh, ancestors who do walk upright, but unfortunately they've gone extinct. One other organism I'm going to mention on this graph is something called the Civipithecus. And so the Civipithecus is an extinct ape ancestor, but the reason it's kind of interesting is because it was found in Asia and we think it is the ancestor of the orangutans. So it is right here on the graph. It would have been its own branch um, related to the orangutans. There are of course many other extinct apes and your textbook does go into a lot of detail on that. So you're welcome to, to learn more about these other interesting animals. But one of the most interesting in my opinion is something called the Gigantopithecus, which is a great name uh, because it was gigantic. It is probably the largest ape that has ever existed. So if you thought gorillas, gorillas were big, this one way surpasses it. And in this graph, you can see an image of one of the largest specimens compared to a human. It was over 10 feet tall. And we estimate based on the skeletal remains that it could have been about a thousand pounds. So huge. If you've ever heard of Bigfoot, um, maybe that's where this myth comes from. Maybe somebody found these ape bones and thought that it was you know, Bigfoot. But in any case, unfortunately, this guy did go extinct but he was really, really big. And he actually just ate plants. So he was kind of like a gentle giant. He wasn't a hunter, uh, but when the environment changed, he went extinct. 
And that wraps it up for chapter eight.